Hello, I'm Noel Lim on ASEAN Speaks by Maybank. Last Friday, the Malaysian government had unveiled its budget 2023 and yesterday the Prime Minister announced the dissolution of Parliament to make way for the general elections, widely speculated to be held in November. Aung San Yao, portfolio strategist, discusses with our analysts on their thoughts on what's ahead for Malaysian equities, fixed income and the economy. Morning everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, to this uh, morning call and to our colleagues in uh, Malaysia. Um, it's great to see you all again. Uh, many things have happened since the uh, long weekend began last Friday. Uh, Parliament uh, was uh, dissolved and also Malaysia's budget 2023 uh, was uh, tabled. Um, so today, in, in anticipation of the uh, market's focus on Malaysia, we will stay here in this country and cover broad risk, uh, a broad range of issues and risk assets. Um, I would like to first take a question, take a first question to Sakti and uh, He's basically our currency strategist. And because he's um, uh, kind of in a rush to uh, catch a plane uh, this morning, uh, we'd like to basically ask him a first question in terms of the USD. Now, the ringgit right now stands at 465. It's not very far from its peak of 488. So my first question to Andy is basically, with the USD so strong, um, what looks, um, uh, uh, you know, is this trend likely to continue? And how will the USD, uh, in your view, is that going to unwind in the uh, medium term? Andy? Hi, Senyo. Um Morning. I think there's three things that if you want to look at the USD, uh, the way I see it, um, there are three sort of drivers that uh, probably is keeping the dollar supported somewhat. First is the interest rate differential. We all know that the central bank's uh, policy rate out of the US is moving sharply, already 300 basis points move. Other central banks have moved as well, but uh, the, the, the interest rate differential is one. Second, the growth differential. Um, the US growth uh, is still significant. Uh, compared to those in Eurozone and the other countries in the world, uh, including the G7 countries. And then thirdly, you have the safe haven differential sort of situation where most people or investors would actually try to hold on to the US dollar. So this, uh, this helps support the US dollar uh, going forward. And not to mention with the financial stability concerns now, uh, it also leads to sentiment driving uh, the US dollar. So these three sort of drivers has helped the dollar support. For the dollar to actually soften, I think you need to see these three things unravel. Uh, on the interest rate front, yes, it's probably narrowing. Other central banks are moving uh, into next year and we probably will see that unravels maybe sometime next year, uh, narrow significantly. On the growth front, yes. So what the Fed is doing is probably going to lead to some level of uh, growth uh, decline or recession out of the US. So that's one that will narrow also next year. But the safe haven differential, I think, will continue to be there. I think the reserves uh, into uh, holding of treasuries and holding on to US dollar will continue to be there, especially when there's concerns about financial stability and systemic concerns uh, out of that. So that, that would need to narrow as well going forward. I think there are some talks about whether there will be eventual move towards a plaza court sort of arrangement. I just want to highlight quickly uh, that the dollar surged by more than 50% against the other majors at that time, the Doshmark, the yen. Uh, 50%. We are now roughly only about 14% um, dollar strength against the major currencies. Uh, we, I, I, in, in my view, I think it, we're probably not going to see a move significant to that similar to the Plaza Accord, uh, although situation now looks somewhat similar uh, in the run-up to the enactment of the Plaza Accord in 1985, but there's a slight difference. Um, the situation or the economies then were different now you have China as a string partner. I don't think um, uh, in any time soon we're going to see China um, sort of agree to such a, a, an arrangement. Uh, so I think it, that, that is one. Second is I think in terms of trying to get the uh, sort of similar original Plaza Accord participants to come to an agreement uh, is uh, unlikely to happen anytime soon as well. Thirdly, I think US Treasury Yellen has made clear that she still wants market exchange rates to determine the value of the dollar. And it's in uh, the US benefit to keep the dollar strong, uh, especially to mitigate some of the important inflation sort of situation. So, uh, and at the same time, the G7 has also committed to non-intervention in currency markets uh, with a renewed commitment as recently as May 2022. 
So we are likely to see a Plaza Court 2.0 sort of situation. Um, so the, the, the only way for it to happen in some ways, the Plaza Court is uh, as long as um, China does not participate uh, and also if inflation concerns persist in the US, it will not happen. So those need to unravel on top of the three things, uh, the three points that I mentioned just now, the interest rate differential narrowing, yes, it's happening. Growth differential will eventually happen in 2023 um, and the safe haven differential. So as long as you don't have any financial stability or crisis issues leading people to support the dollar front. Uh, so, so back to your question in simple terms, uh, the dollar strength will continue until the end of the year and possibly into first quarter of next year uh, uh, or even the first half of next year. Sing out. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for that, Andy. We'll let you uh, uh, go on that uh, and, and uh, you know, keep a very close watch on the uh, USD uh, front. We'll catch you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so Jaime, let me take the uh, next uh, question over to you then. You know, with the uh, budget 2023, uh, that was tabled last uh, Friday. Uh, it, you know, coming at a size of 370 billion. It's actually slightly lower than what is projected for uh, FY22. So it is, you know, neither expansionary nor one that signals, uh, 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 you know, a very strong fiscal consolidation. With this budget uh, projected to run at 5.5% uh, deficit to uh, GDP, were you disappointed? Hi, morning, uh, Seng Yao. Um, I'm neither dis disappointed or excited. I think overall, I'm pretty neutral about the budget. As you pointed out, uh, the budget size itself is a bit lower than this year's. Uh, and as per deficit to GDP ratio, 5.5% next year is down from 5.5% this year, which in itself is revised from the original budget 22 target of 6%. Uh, obviously, the ratio reflects arithmetic effect of growth in the denominator, which is nominal GDP. But the value of government deficit spending is little changed at 99.1 billion next year from 99.5 billion ringgit this year. So overall, fiscal policy stance is neutral in our view to keep fiscal support uh, on the domestic economic growth, which is expected to moderate to 4%, 5% range next year from 6.5% to 7% range this year, given the external headwinds. But at the same time, I think still keeping deficit spending somewhat in check amid the current volatile financial and currency markets, taking cue from what happened in the UK financial market and currency following the announcements of the mini budget there. Right. Your good point about the denominator earlier. And let's uh, look at the numerator, right? Uh, a lot of things can also constrain Malaysia's revenue plans, especially when one takes an account of war, recession, uh, and the fact that Petronas and Palm oil exports make up a fair share of revenues. Now, with the uh, 12 Malaysia plans target to hit 3.5% deficit by 2025, um, you know, regardless, would a, would a more aggressive path for fiscal consolidation be more appropriate? I think it is something that's uh, likely to happen um, in in 2024, 2025. Um, I, I, but I think the budget 2023 has laid a foundation for that because it hinted at the subsidy rationalization by shifting to targeted from uh, blanket subsidies, which is a start. But well, obviously, this must be complemented by sustainable revenue sources to reduce dependence on the volatile commodity-related incomes and the one-off tax and revenue enhancement measures like Chukai Makmo. That's the case this year. Uh, new tax mentioned in budget 2023 includes plan to adopt the 15% minimal uh, effective global tax rate in 2024 and to eventually introduce carbon tax. There was no mention of GST comeback, obviously, given the upcoming general election, but I think we have to wait for more details on these tax reforms and revenue enhancement measures, uh, which are pending the unveiling of the medium-term revenue strategy next year after the no-show this year. And I think in addition, uh, we also must see political will to address inefficiencies, mismanagements, wastages, leakages in, in government spending. Okay. Let me just bring in TJ for a comment uh, on the commodities. Now, TJ, budget 2023 assumes $90 per barrel uh, crude. 
and I think about 4,300 uh, ringgit per ton in terms of the CPO price. Uh, you estimate in a recent report that oil prices will likely stay at uh, $100 per barrel uh, between 2022 and 2023. What's your rationale for this, uh, TJ? Hi, uh, Sengyao. Morning, everybody. Uh, our view is basically based on the fundamentals per se. Uh, what we are seeing now is on uh, basically uh, two parts. First of all, on a fundamental basis, I think what we are seeing here is that uh, the sector itself is facing uh, structural underinvestments. So what it means here is that uh, as con uh, demand rises, uh, the supply is depleting. And that is the case, uh, what we are seeing now there, uh, where oil price will remain elevated. Secondly, here is that uh, on the OPEC uh, plus uh, real production itself, what we are seeing here is that the policy is to favor for a higher oil price uh, versus higher production. So this works well for all these uh, OPEC plus uh, nations that are in this pact. And if you were to look at it, in, term, in the reality of it, in terms of uh, what they plan to uh, deliver in terms of production versus uh, the real capacity that they're able to produce, there is also a, a deficit. So in, in actual fact, uh, what they are seeing now is that they, are, they have not been able to produce up to the level of expectations. Uh, hence, we, that's why we think that the oil price will still remain high next year. Okay. Uh, TJ, I, I, I'm just very curious here, right? You know, US really has few good options in countering OPEC oil cuts. Today, uh, I think just two hours ago, Financial Times reported that the UAE leader, uh, he himself will also be meeting Putin uh, in Moscow uh, very soon. What's really going on with these uh, polemics? Um, uh, can you maybe give us some color on that front? Okay, I think uh, the... The gist of it is that uh, it's basically uh, whether are you a follower of US view, which is Biden's. Because uh, for Biden, uh, what he wants in his agenda is to have a lower energy price uh, in, 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 in all uh, aspects of it. Because uh, for US, uh, they are the biggest consumer of energy in terms of road transportations. That is one. Secondly, is to counter uh, Russia's move in terms of uh, their, their impact move into Ukraine. Uh, Russia is one of the key producers of oil in the world. Uh, they are one of the top three. Uh, they, they basically sell about, uh, they, they produce about 11 million barrels per day, which is about 11% of uh, world global uh, supply. So if they're able to basically reduce uh, Russia's uh, energy supply then basically they could basically affect the uh, I mean the, the income gain from that itself right so it looks like uh, you know his midterms uh, are going to be quite interesting to watch in the US as well so I mean let me uh, uh, bring you back here for one last question now foreign investors are looking at Malaysia from three lenses in light of G15 policy paralysis is probably one of the biggest risks here uh, the current account of uh, outlook is is still looking good at this moment, especially if the commodity cycles uh, stay up uh, for longer and for higher. Uh, and last but not least, inflation be kept under control. Uh, is on this last point, if fuel subsidies are completely removed, actual inflation rate will be you know nowhere in this two or three percent range, but much closer to ten percent. Now, with TJ's target, uh, how will the government actually rationalize its fuel subsidy uh, program? Yeah, as, as mentioned earlier, uh, budget 2023 alluded to the implementation of targeted fuel subsidy, but obviously uh, lacking on the specifics in terms of the mechanics and timeline. Uh, but in our budget 2023 preview note issued on 25th September, we, we highlighted or suggested that the targeted fuel subsidy mechanism may involve rebates subject to limits or quota that are credited into bank accounts and e-wallets of qualified fuel subsidy recipients. Uh, this is in exchange for a gradual periodic adjustment in the fuel prices. Um, 
since the complete removal of subsidy for petrol and diesel would be hugely inflationary, as you pointed out, it is uh, estimated that inflation rate will be around 10%, 11% as a result. And I think, interestingly enough, in budget 2023, there is this one particular measure, the widening of the e-wallet credit schemes to cover M40 income groups and more youth, uh, which may well be in preparation for the rollout of the targeted fuel subsidy. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that. I'd like to now bring in Anand to uh, give us a view on the uh, equity markets. Um, Anand, uh, you know, there was uh, only one GE that happened uh, soon after the tabling of the budget, and that was GE 10. What's the difference between GE 10 and GE 15 uh, now? Well, I think the big difference for the market is the outcome of the GE is so much more in doubt uh, this time around than in GE 10. I think in G10, nobody was surprised that the Wooden government came back. Uh, you know, after the elections, it was a uh, you know very different time. I think uh, you know in this case we're facing a lot of uncertainty with these elections. Uh, two primary reasons: one, it's a much more fractious uh, political scene. So instead of head-on fights, you know, uh, opposition versus uh, incumbent, you could have multi-cornered fights. So that injects a lot of uncertainty into the outcome. The second thing is the massive increase in the number of registered voters between GE14 and GE15 is unprecedented. You know, we've seen a 40% increase in the number of voters uh, due to the UNDI18 uh, Act, uh, as well as automatic uh, voter registration. So now we have a lot more voters, we have a lot more parties contesting for seats. So I think you know, the market uh, is facing a much more uncertain outcome uh, and will be uh, appropriately defensive as compared to GE10 when Really, everyone expected continuation, and continuation was what they got. Okay, uh, we, I think, uh, Suhaimi had given a bit of preview in terms of the uh, development expenditures early on. Uh, who are the big winners, sector winners, uh, and, and what's your packing order? Yeah, I think when it comes to development expenditure, the probably the most practical way uh, to invest uh, in that thematic is always construction. Uh, and in, the, in this case, you know, the biggest allocation between development within the development expenditure pie was again to transport, yeah, which is basically highways uh, and uh, roads, et cetera. And I think uh, Gamuda, uh, IJM well, would be the clear beneficiaries uh, from this, uh, you know, uh, big spending in that segment. But though, you know, we would temper that by saying uh, there was nothing really new in terms of mega projects, uh, but we were comforted that MRT3 was reaffirmed. And that by itself is already a 50 billion uh, ringgit uh, project, which will be spread out over many years. So that one, I think uh, if you want to play that, uh, it would really be Gamuda. Uh, for the rest of the development expenditure, uh, you know, in, in, in health, in hosp building hospitals, et cetera, much more difficult to play, Senya, yeah, because it, it tends to involve a lot of private sector, unlisted entities who would tend to bid for those projects. And, and, and uh, you know, I guess that's part of the political uh, uh, dynamic in Malaysia as well. You know, this is how you keep your voter base happy uh, by <laughs> parceling out projects. Uh, so practically, it is really only listed construction players like Gamuda and IGM, which we can sort of play uh, on this DE uh, or record development expenditure amount. Okay, all right. Um, you know, I recall in in uh, uh, another GB call uh, that you spoke in um, that uh, ASEAN as a whole. Uh, stood out very well in terms of performance relative to the other developed markets. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, um, I believe it benefited from some of the flows as well. When we look at some of these sectors that that you're watching, especially on your buy list, uh, have they moved at all in 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 a way that will make them that will price them out of uh, the cheap range? Yeah, I think, you know, from a relative performance basis is what we usually talk about rather than absolute. Uh, ASEAN has been outperforming uh, and Malaysia, uh, you know, has been outperforming as part of that ASEAN dynamic. I must say, when we look at the sectors, uh, none have actually showed absolute upside. Uh, even the most defensive sectors uh, have, uh, have corrected. Uh, the issue is, or the point is, they haven't corrected by as much as their, uh, you know, uh, developed market counterparts. Uh, even our, uh, you know, I think one sector that perhaps we always find interesting is the tech sector uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, you know, the tech index in Malaysia is down about 35%, which actually is, is a little bit worse off uh, than the NASDAQ. Uh, so the sell off there has been uh, perhaps uh, overly pronounced uh, in our view. And the second thing is, and this ties back to the budget, you know, and, 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 the, and the fact that you pointed out, you know, fiscal consolidation 
you know, we're not really on a very aggressive path. We're, we're going to be spending a lot more <laughs> than we are receiving in revenues for a while yet. And that's always a bad sort of uh, dynamic for currency. Uh, uh, the ringgit is in particular when you're spending more than you have. Uh, and you see this in the UK as well, the, you know, with their supplementary budget. So to me, the tax sector is perhaps the most interesting uh, in this sell-off in the sense that Malaysian tech is actually underperforming even developed markets. And we have this extended weak ringgit dynamic, which is extremely favorable for Malaysian tech because their costs are in domestic ringgit, but they're exporting in US dollars. So to me, that sector and our picks there, like Inari, Frontcan, Vitrox, uh, are really standing to benefit uh, for an extended period from this dynamic. Okay. Now we spoke a, a fair bit in terms of uh, the winners uh, in, in this scenario. What about the biggest loser, losers? Could you maybe share a few thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't think there are any particular losers per se. I think the one policy in the budget uh, that sort of uh, has a negative connotation for many sectors which rely on foreign labor in a big way uh, was this uh, policy of a multi-tiered uh, foreign, foreign labor levy structure. Basically, it means the more foreign laborers you use in your operations, the more levies you pay to the government. Yeah, so that will impact uh, big users of foreign labor quite negatively. And that would include sectors as diverse as construction, uh, plantations, uh, and even manufacturing. Yeah, some of the uh, EMS players, electronics manufacturing services players like VSI, uh, like ATA, like uh, SKP, uh, use uh, quite a lot of foreign labor uh, because it is a very labor intensive process. So they will be paying more levies to the government and that will have a negative margin impact. Got it. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, uh, Anand. Um, let me bring in the uh, credit team right now to talk a little bit about uh, uh, that side of the world. Uh, Money, um, with the pace of uh, fiscal consolidation falling short of expectations, um, you know, uh, basically, I think the markets were basically expecting 5% uh, deficit in, in 2023 versus what, what it actually turned out to be. Is the debt ceiling high enough to meet funding needs? Uh, hi, yes. Uh, the size of deficit for 2023 is estimated to be a little change uh, at around $99 billion based on the 5.5% deficit ratio target. And using the growth and fiscal assumptions under the medium-term fiscal framework uh, for 2023 to 2025, we estimate the headline debt ratio is expected to rise to around 64% and the statutory debt ratio to around 62%. So this is still within the statutory debt limit, which was raised to 65% of GDP during the pandemic, and, but is due to expire in December. So we think this suggests to us that the 65% statutory debt limit will likely need to be extended or made permanent. Okay. Um, you know, my next question is, is basically looking at this from an uh, uh, international uh, financial market perspective. Do you think there's... I don't feel it right now, but do you think there's pressure to rush the uh, fiscal consolidation for Malaysia to preserve its uh, A minus? I think, uh, uh, yeah, A minus the rating by S and P just in June, I believe. Uh, yes, I think we agree with you. Uh, in short, we also don't think so. So in June 2022, S and P's last rating action uh, not only revised the outlook of Malaysia from double A minus negative back to double A minus with a stable outlook. Uh, they also reduced its downward sensitivity to public indebtedness and fiscal performance, and will instead rely more on the assessment of both prospects and effectiveness of policy making, uh, which can be subjective. So in all, we think this budget's impact on sovereign rating is slightly neutral and carries less weight compared to the upcoming general election. Okay. All right. Thanks. Maybe lastly, let's uh, kind of talk a little bit about the PDS market or the uh, corporate uh, uh, bond uh, market. Um, you know, with the development expenditure that we spoke about with Sir Jaime uh, earlier, and 95 billion, um, this is a shade less than what it was in uh, what it is right now in FY22. Um, um, do you uh, uh, see that any of these uh, 200, 200 over bond issuers uh, in in uh, in Malaysia falling anywhere within these uh, sectors that would likely uh, be a focus uh, for investors. 
I think like uh, Anand also mentioned, uh, it's a heavily more towards the transportation sector. So uh, we are also of the opinion that the construction sector will, will benefit the most. Uh, so in the credit space, we do have uh, IGM Corporation, Gamuda, uh, as well as WCT. Uh, also, uh, when we did a 10-year rating migration across the PDS space, we also noticed that this construction sector has also been one of the more stable ones. There's been no rating changes in the last decade. Uh, so we think this is a safe space to look into. Okay. Uh, the other thing is probably auto with elect, uh, given the incentives for electric vehicles. Okay, interesting that you didn't mention about telecoms. Uh, is, is there anything interesting uh, uh, to watch out for in the telecom space? I think in the telecom space, we, we like the uh, telco towers actually. And we think with the DNBs and the 5G network, uh, it will benefit them the most. Okay. Uh, right. The other thing we are also waiting for is uh, we'll see if DNB needs to raise financing in the bond market. Got it. Okay. Um, so we spoke about your positive biases for the PDS mar market. What about your negative biases and what, what our investors ought to be staying away from? Uh, okay, so in our rating migration, uh, we did notice five sectors uh, showing this negative rating bias. What this means is the rating challenges in the sector have been skewed to more downgrades with no or little upgrade. So some of these sectors are the trading and services, industrials, diversified, uh, telco and property and REIT. So, uh, but this was mostly due to the impact from the pandemic and industry headwinds. Right. Uh, just to clarify for the telco, this was a, there was a downgrade on Cellcom, but this was a few years ago when their leverage was an issue. Right. Okay. All right. Maybe just as a wrapper, um, has the Ringgit PDS uh, uh, um, um, as a class, right? Have they outperformed US credit and, and why is this the case? Uh, yes, so year to date, the Ringgit corporate credit has performed the US corporate credit sector. So uh, just for illustration, the Bloomberg US IG and high yield composite spreads have widened around 60 bit and 210 bit to 155 bit for the IG and nearly 500 bit from the high yield. So, but this is still below the peak. So for example, the high yield was above 580 bit seen in early July. Meanwhile, in the PDS space, the average of five to 10 year double A3 spreads have only widened just three bit to around 90 bit. We think the relative stability in PDS performance can be attributed to firstly, the stable domestic credit conditions, uh, two, the ample liquidity supporting the demand for PDS this year, uh, three, low net supply, and four, PDS market mostly consisting of buy and hold investors. Uh, while these factors will continue to support the PDS, we do think tight spreads provide little cushion against a risk of sentiment in the bearish scenario, especially if a possible US recession turns out to be severe. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for that summary. If there are any questions that you might have for our panelists, please feel free to send them over to us and we'll uh, do our best to get the responses back to you. Uh, with that, I'm going to end the call right now. Thank you for your time this morning and uh, good luck hunting this week. Speak to your trading advisor or trading rep and check out Market Insights on the Maybank Trade app for more information. Also follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. I'm Noel Lim on Asian Speaks by Maybank. Bank.